Welcome to Root Words, a podcast that explores agriculture and cooking's role in connecting us to our landscape and our communities. I'm Stephen Abatel. Root Words is a collaboration between Vermont Farmers Food Center, Shrewsbury Agricultural Education and Arts Foundation, and many other community members. We're excited to introduce you to some passionate folks that are bringing communities together around food. So please pull up a chair and enjoy. Root Words returns with a special five-part series to take a closer look at the growing effort to localize our food system. Localized food systems are gaining regional and national attention for the benefits that go beyond food production and consumption. Rural and urban communities across the United States and the world are building local food networks for greater resilience, stronger local economies, better health, and social well-being. Vermont Farmers Food Center is a food hub that's creating an alternative to the existing food system by rooting food production and access in a particular place. In this series, we're going to explore how a focus on local food builds relationships with people and the environment. And we'll discuss how a local food center can contribute to the regional and global impact that localization may have on our economic and environmental sustainability. Localizing the regional food system is the Vermont Farmers Food Center's stated mission. In our first episode of this special series, we're taking a deeper dive into why localizing the food system is important and why it's so important now. The Cambridge English Dictionary defines localization as the process of organizing a business or industry so that its main activities happen in local areas rather than nationally or internationally. Today's guests will help us understand why localization is needed now and how it creates change to the existing nationalized food system. Steve Gorlick is the Managing and Programs Director for Local Futures, an organization that promotes localization around the world. He is the co-director of the film The Economics of Happiness, author of Small is Beautiful, Big is Subsidized, and co-author of Bringing the Food Economy Home. He lives in Vermont with his wife, where they grow most of their own food and blueberries for market. We're very glad to talk with Steve to help us understand why localization is what the world needs now. Well, I, I think the the vision is that we we face a number of serious crises, whether they're ecological or economic or social or um, uh any, any of these crises uh, have their roots, as we see it, in a globalized economy that doesn't respect uh, human needs or, or ecological limits. And um, what we're promoting is essentially small scale, a, a, a shift from global to local. Right now, the the global economy is heavily subsidized um, through taxes, subsidies, um, and promoted through regulatory um, regimes that make it easier for the global players to to operate and harder for the smaller players to operate. So we're we're working towards shifting that around um, so that uh, the small and local is promoted instead of the large and global. And and what are some of the, uh, the the tools that you're using to uh, to get your message out there or to um, help affect that change? Yeah, well, we we've we've been around for uh, over forty years, and um, we've worked both in a hands-on way, mostly in a, a region called Ladakh or Little Tibet. It's in northern. India, uh, right on the border with uh, Tibet and Pakistan, and it's a it's a place where the organization really started. Um, the The woman who started the organization, Helena Norberg Hodge, was one of the first outsiders to to visit the region when it was first opened up to development and the global economy, and she found a culture that really worked. It uh, nobody went hungry. Everyone, um, there was no unemployment. There was no homelessness. Women had high status. 
There was hardly any gap between rich and poor. The, there was no shortage of resources. Um, there was no environmental pollution. And all of this uh, changed almost within within a decade of opening up to the outside world. All of the, all of those problems changed or, or appeared in Ladakh, and so it gave us a a window into what the root cause of the the many crises we face today. And um, so we worked there part partly bringing information about the changes that were being imposed or that people were being um, asked to embrace things like uh, pesticides and herbicides, which they had never used. All the, all the agriculture there was organic, uh, but you had these outside experts coming in saying, oh yeah, you can increase your yields by using this chemical without giving people any sense of what the long-term effects of that would be. And uh, so there, there were lots of things like that, that people with no experience of the modern world would have a, a really hard time making choices because on the surface, things look like ad, they're advantageous, but in the long run, not so. So we brought a lot of information about what development has done elsewhere. We also brought in um, a lot of appropriate technologies uh, to improve standards of living without tying people into the to the global economy and the oil economy. Once we realized that the problems in Ladakh emanated from this global system, that uh, there's no way to protect any one culture from this economy, we had to actually address the the global economy itself. So. Tell me a bit more about that. What are what is not working in our present economic system? What are some of those problems? And 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 then if you can actually get that a little more uh, whittled down to what isn't working for a place like Rutland County in Vermont, yeah. you really almost need to look at the theoretical underpinnings of what drives uh, decision making in the global economy. And there's. There's things like GDP, which e almost every uh, country uses as a yardstick of, of economic health. And this is problematic because uh, GDP measures only um, uh, monetary transactions. It, it, it just it aggregates all those monetary transactions. And the more there are, the better the health of the economy is presumed to be. What this doesn't take into account is that uh, if you're spending a lot of money on burglar alarms and prisons because crime is so high, this is actually a negative and should not be added to the to the yardstick, but subtracted from it. And the same with environmental pollution. Uh, if you have to clean up a toxic waste site, the money spent on that adds to GDP. At the same time, if you have an intact forest that is providing a lot of ecosystem services, you know, clean air and water, wildlife habitat, it, it does not enter GDP calculations until it's cut down and then it's added as a plus. So that's one of the problems with the the global globalized economy is that the measures the measurements that we use are just um, inaccurate and they promote growth without any sense of whether this is good growth or bad growth. There's a there's also a, uh, an economic theory that goes back to the 1700s called comparative advantage. And this, even though it really doesn't apply anymore, it still undergirds what policymakers um, uh, choose to do with their economies. And the idea of comparative advantage is that you choose whatever product you can produce most effectively, and you focus only on that, and use the you trade trade that product and use the proceeds to buy everything else you need. So when it comes to food, um, you end up with uh, countries that produce only coffee 
or primarily coffee, let's say, or palm oil, or wheat, or um, any any of these other globally traded commodities, and then use the proceeds to buy food to feed the population. This is essentially the opposite of what localization is about. Localization uh, is about meeting most of your needs or as many of your needs as close to home as possible. And when you are um, specializing your production in one or two items and uh, you're uh, buying everything else that you need with the proceeds from selling that product, you're very vulnerable to uh, changes in tastes or, or prices globally or um, if one year you have a bad harvest in that one crop that you produce, um, you will suffer far more um, than if you had a diversified economy where even though that one crop didn't do well, you have other crops that you can depend on. And I think that um, I think Vermont historically had produced milk or dairy as its, its prime well, not uh, historically, there was a period where it was sheep, uh, but in recent years, it's been dairy. And the dairy industry is now in a shambles in Vermont. Um, the number of farmers has dropped precipitously ever since the 1960s. Uh, and that that is actually, in a sense, it's a result of this idea of comparative advantage that that because uh, Vermont is suited to dairy production, that that should be our our main um, agricultural product. I, I remember when um, uh, Jim Douglas was governor, his uh, agriculture secretary was asked about the declining number of farmers in Vermont. And his response was, I don't care how many farmers there are, I care about how much milk we're producing. And this again is the opposite of localization because in um, a local economy, you wanna have lots and lots of small producers. You don't want one giant monopoly that um, provides all of uh, your production or you don't, and you don't want um, one monopoly that sells everything that people need. We are there is there is you know signs of of change in that. Uh, there are uh, I don't think that any agriculture secretary in Vermont would now say that the number of farmers doesn't matter. It's only the volume of milk produced, um, and there is more. Um, awareness of the benefits of local food. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to um, promote local food at home and exports abroad, which is what pretty much every state does. They, they give a lot of lip service to the idea of local food because they want, the, want local farmers to succeed, but then they um, promote exports as well, so that they're actually working to undermine the economic viability of small farmers somewhere else. Uh, I think to, to really have a, a holistic and comprehensive view of localization, you have to promote it, or you have to recognize that it should apply everywhere, not just to your, to your region, but everywhere. Um, so, uh, cheese producers in Vermont that celebrate themselves as local food producers, but then invade the markets of, uh, small farmers in other states are really not doing what the, what's needed to be done. Um, so the way what what's happened because of this, because of the idea of specializing production, uh, for export and this global economy that's dominated by these huge agribusinesses, where well, the food economy is dominated by these huge agribusinesses that are trading commodities all over the world. What you end up with 
is truly insane, which is that um, countries will import and export virtually identical products and virtually identical quantities of them. And it's also that these traders can take advantage of minute price differentials or um, in some cases difference in labor costs. But for example, the, um, the US is the world's biggest exporter of beef but it's also the world's biggest importer of beef with about $5 billion in beef imported and exported every year. Um, the UK, another example, exports about $250 million worth of butter every year and imports about the same amount. Um, and then uh, sometimes, as I said, this trade is not just to take advantage of some price differential or subsidy somewhere in the world, it's about taking advantage of cheap processing labor. And a, a example of this is that um, shrimp that's harvested off the coast of Scotland is shipped 6,000 miles to Thailand just to be peeled. And then it's shipped back to the UK to be sold to consumers. And this sort of thing happens all over the world Almost every country does it. And well, it's not the countries that are doing it, it's the, the agribusiness traders that are doing it. Um, and one might wonder how this is, passes muster with things like the Paris Climate Accords, that uh, food is being needlessly shipped, sometimes across entire oceans, uh, when the identical product is available right next door. And one of the reasons for that is that um, international transport is off the table for the climate negotiations. If you ask what, what, you know, what country is responsible for all the bunker fuel in all the ships that are crossing the oceans with food, um, no country is. Those are completely excluded. And the same with, uh, with global um, air transport. Um, the jet fuel is not counted. So that's one of the ways that um, the free trade mantra is distorting the decision-making of policymakers, even when it comes to something like climate change. There is such a belief that trade is good, more trade is better, we can't mess with trade. And of course, the, the, the corporations that are involved in all this are at the negotiating tables um, presenting this idea that it shouldn't be touched. So that's just another where, area where uh, resistance is needed. We need to start um, making imported food and exported food pay the full price of uh rather than get a, a free ride um you know when you go into the, the the market and it looks like local food is more expensive than imported food a big part of the reason is these subsidies and regulations that are so skewed that they they do benefit um, exported and imported food over local food. So that's that's just another area where we really need to pay attention and um, argue for something that's that's more sane. What are localization's impacts on the on the region? So if we are localizing, uh, what do those impacts look like for the region? And then even I guess globally, what is it, what are the impacts of localization on the global market? I mean, at, at Local Futures, we talk about uh, the need for two kinds of action, resistance and renewal. The renewal side of things includes um, all the farmers markets and CSAs that have sprung up in Vermont, all the home gardens and community gardens that are already providing local food. The resistance side of the equation, um, as I said earlier it's a it's about educating ourselves about how the global system works and communicating that to friends neighbors family it involves understanding how 
so-called free trade treaties have given global corporations power to invade local economies worldwide, how they've stripped even national governments of the ability to protect local resources and labor from, um, from these global corporations. Um, we need to look at how the global food system is subsidized by our own tax dollars, both directly and through, um, probably more importantly, through infrastructure spending, particularly in transport, uh, things that make imported food less expensive than local food. So what we need to do in terms of resistance, um, one of the things we can do is to tell our elected representatives that we don't want Walmart and Cargill subsidized any longer. We want small farmers and local businesses supported instead. Um, so without both of those things, we're not going to see as much change locally, or regionally, or nationally, or globally as, as we could. The global system is so large and powerful that the impact of any one local initiative can easily seem pretty insignificant by comparison. Um, and there's so there's often a tendency to think, oh, wow, this, this farmer's market is really good. We need to scale it up. But rather than scaling up small local initiatives, we have to think about small scale on a large scale, which means scaling out rather than up. In other words, there's no sense in saying that this farmer's market is very successful, let's make it 10 times as big, or this CSA is very successful, let's expand it to, to 1,000 members. Because then you end up starting to replicate the the problems of the global system locally you're you're um by scaling up you are making for example a, a you know a big regional farmers market that attracts people from all over the state well everyone is driving further the food is traveling further the smaller markets in the periphery are going to suffer from that and you don't that's not what you want so um, we need to scale out and instead of scaling up if we want to have a lasting and uh, real impact, both locally and globally. Um, that's, that's why the resistance side of the coin is so important, because uh, getting um, more farmers on the land, getting um, more local markets, getting more local food into markets. Um, it's it's you're running against uh, both the subsidies and the regulations that that impede the local. And in terms of the regulations, I would just mention right now the the really onerous rules around raw milk and on farm slaughter that make it. Uh, almost impossible, or at least very difficult for small farmers to legally sell those products even to their own neighbors. So there, there is things that could be done um, at a very local statewide level that could uh, really uh, make a difference. And uh, there's lots of things that could be done at a local level, at a global level. And unfortunately, those are more difficult. They involve things like um, renegotiating trade treaties, um, that sort of thing. Um, but all of those, for, for there to really be a shift, um, all of those things need to happen. What, what would help that happen is if um, local and state and national governments stopped supporting the large and global and supported the small and local instead and that means everything from looking at everything from um, tax policy to subsidies to regulations, all of which currently support the large and global. And if we shifted that, it would be much easier to scale out um, the local renewal issue uh, initiatives that are so successful already. To get a better understanding of the impact localization is having in our Northeast region, I sat down with Shane Rogers with Food Solutions New England. 
Food Solutions New England is a multiracial network of organizations, businesses, people, really anybody who is striving to work towards a more just and equitable food system in the New England region. And what we're trying to build is a regional food movement that aligns and grows together to really make some transformative impact. And our role specifically, you know, we work in four impact areas around network, expansion and movement weaving, equity leadership development and practice, regional policy coordination and narrative strategy. But the folks who are involved with Food Solutions New England, the people who are a part of the network, the organizations, the businesses, they work on every facet of the food system from soil health to and compost to supply chains to what we're pulling out of the ocean for seafood and coast to labor. And it's a recognition that our food system is large and complex and has so many different players in it and so many different people that are interacting with it. And if we want to, again, build a climate resilient future, a future that is based on the needs of the community, we all have a small part to play. And we all have a part to play in supporting each other as well. When you start to look at the problems of the food system, you know, it's my personal belief that a lot of it comes down to the fact that our food system was never really designed to actually feed people first and foremost. It is designed to derive profit. And our economic system is set up in a way where folks even in Rutland County who are working in the food system who maybe want to center community first are still forced to make decisions about what is going to bring in enough money so they can afford things like housing and healthcare and their own food for their own table. So while the food system in and of itself, you know, while we may be working on the food system in and of itself, we have to first recognize that it intersects with so many of the other issues that are present in our communities and in our society today. And this really manifests in a lot of ways, right? This manifests in folks not being able to access local food because the costs are so high compared to the subsidized national and international food that is being shipped in from around the country. In turn, that exasperates our climate chaos that we're seeing ravage New England. I mean, Vermont just experienced historic flooding, as we all know. And we can't separate that from the fact that our supply chains are long and complex and our food is coming in not only just from California, but from overseas. And it's contributing to the climate changes that we're seeing and is exasperating some of that chaos that we're continuing to have to grapple with. And we could run through that list of issues, right? Food insecurity remains high. We see young farmers not being able to access land because land has become an investment. It's a finite resource that folks with more capital are able to uh, invest in. Folks who have been traditionally subjected to marginalization are continuing to be boxed out of food production and being able to access food that they find uh, culturally appropriate, that they want to be eating. So our food system, again, it's complex, it's huge, and can feel relatively overwhelming. And one of the things at Food Solutions New England that we really like to lift up is that there are community solutions to all of these problems. That decision to dive in on what is going to be the best system to feed the community can be replicated. That can be the guiding ethos for how we start to set up a food system in tandem with this globalized system that we currently have that is, again, exasperating all these issues. So when we look towards where we want to go, we know that the community has to be consulted first and foremost because the community are their most best experts in understanding how best to feed themselves. And to be clear, I'm not talking about isolation in any way. We still have to maintain relationships with 
communities all over the map, we still have to be able to respond to disasters because the fact is that we're going to keep getting them. We're going to have to keep adapting to them. And Rutland has a huge role in, to play in supporting places, you know, like Middlebury, Burlington, Montpelier, um, and other places in New England when things hit the fan and all of a sudden folks are cut off from those local supply chains as well as the global supply chains. Rutland has a role to play. In the 19th century, Rutland was a regional hub for the railways. Some intrepid folks think that Rutland is a prime location to once again be a regional hub, this time for a relocalized food system. Back in episode 9, we examined the concept of a food hub. I had a lot of fun diving into the town's history for that story, and it's still an episode worth checking out. But to learn what role food hubs have to play in the future of Vermont's agriculture, I spoke with Ellen Kaler, Executive Director with Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and a member of the Governor's Commission on the Future of Vermont Agriculture. So, Ellen, how do we see food hubs supporting Vermont's agriculture in the future? Yeah, I think food hubs are playing an increasingly important role um, in the distribution of, of local food products. I mean, what we have seen over the last 50 years, and even more so accelerated in the last 20 years, has been the consolidation in the food system where there are fewer and fewer distributors, there's fewer and fewer retailers. There's something like four major retail chains that own something like 60 to 70% of all retail outlets in the country, for instance. There's like three or four massive distributors of food, for instance. A lot of uh, your major retail chains own their own distribution system. They own the warehouses. And so they are 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 price makers, right? They they say how much they're willing to pay for the the product that a uh, primary producer is 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 offering to sell through their channel. So so because of that consolidation, smaller producers like what we have in Vermont, it's really hard for them sometimes to just get on trucks. And especially if if a, a, a farm is really at the end of a dirt road, getting uh, more traditional retail, uh, traditional distributors to be willing to drive down that road to pick up a smaller quantity of product, uh, sometimes they can't even get them to do that. And so, for instance, we used to have a really robust partner in this local food development work in Black River Produce before they sold to Reinhardt and then who then sold to PFG Group, which is one of the largest distributors in the country. It's a multi-billion dollar co corporation. What we've seen is that they have steadily dropped their services uh, to providing just trucking service, for instance, to smaller producers like what Black River Produce used to do. And they're not willing to pick up larger or smaller quantities from, from our smaller producers here in Vermont. And so there's a real gap then in the ability of some producers to get into wholesale markets, like to even get on a truck to then be aggregated, to then go on to say uh, a Hannaford's or a Whole Foods in Southern New England, for instance, let alone some other place in Vermont. So what you're what we've seen is there have been an increase in in some private sector smaller distributors like Lesser Distributing and Pumpkin Village and such, but then there's also been a rise and increase in in uh, the expansion and 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 the territory the ge geographical territory of some of our food hubs, including the the Farmers Food Center, but also Food Connects down in Brattleboro and. Uh, Farm Connects, which is up serving the Northeast Kingdom and uh, places south and the Intervale Center, all of these uh, food hubs that exist, they really specialize and do a phenomenal job of providing a service, distribution trucking service, as well as an aggregation and selling service to smaller producers in the in our in the state, around the state. And increasingly, they're finding opportunities to uh, cross dock with each other so that if, uh, for instance, the Farmers Food Center needs to get some of its the product that it's servicing uh, local producers in the Rutland area needs, there's some places in, in, in um, 
let's say in Wyndham County, some retailers that would like to, to, to have those products, Food Connects can serve as a as a as a truck that you know could could be connecting up with the Farmers Food Center to then take that product down into Wyndham County and be able to be sold uh, to some of their accounts. So there's some real innovation happening at the food hub level. Um, the you know, infrastructure is expensive. Having having bricks and mortar uh, is really expensive. Having freezers and and coolers and chillers and and uh, wet and dry storage can be expensive. It adds to the cost of food, right? And so this cross docking where you're literally connecting truck to truck and transferring things truck to truck is an innovative way of getting around the need for some of that bricks and mortar. There's lots of ways in which uh, we're innovating to try to meet the growing demand for moving local food around where uh, it's not going through these humongous multi-million, multi-billion dollar distributors anymore. So you mentioned Black River Produce. For our listeners that don't know what we're talking about here, Black River Produce was a small regional distributor started in the late 70s, primarily dealing with local produce and fruit. They were acquired by Reinhardt Food Service, a Chicago-based corporation in 2016. Do you see the growth and transition as a local success story or perhaps a cautionary tale for our food hubs? Well, I think it's it's a challenge in it just generally in the way in which our market-based economy works, right? You have two people who were the primary owners of Black River Produce and they got to a point in their careers where they wanted to retire from being in that business. They didn't want to run the business anymore. And they looked around, my understanding is they looked around for and explored many different options from employee ownership to uh, being purchased more locally. And ultimately, they ended up settling on the Reinhardt Group, hoping that Reinhardt was indicating that one of the reasons why they really liked they wanted to to buy Black River Produce and why they were the successful suitor was because they had a lot of Vermont accounts in schools and other food service uh, entities. And so they saw the benefit of the Black River, Pro, uh, Black River Produce's local foods program as being a real asset, a real benefit to what they were trying to do. And then, as is the case when consolidation happens, you know, it's kind of like there's the little fish in the sea that's eaten up by the bigger fish that's then eaten up by the bigger fish, which is then eaten up by the even bigger fish, right? That tends to be, unfortunately, what happens in, in late stage capital economies, capitalistic economies. And so it just so happened that a few years later, Reinhardt was then purchased by the PFG group. And, you know, I don't even pretend to have any sense about why they wanted to buy up Reinhardt or you know, ancillary Black River produce, we just know the results, right? The results are that Black River has a much diminished local food program than what they used to have. And a lot of smaller producers no longer have access to distribution services. So I don't think that there's any risk of, of our food hubs in, in Vermont going the way of Black River and uh, and Reinhardt up to PFG because one, there's a values alignment. Second, Secondly, most of them are nonprofit organizations, not for profits, and the scale is just completely different. So uh, I don't think there's any risk there, but I think um, it is trying to figure out long term how do you continue to innovate as a food hub in light of the fact that the market is so consolidated and the scale of operations are such that it can be really difficult to to compete on price because we can't compete on price, right? The, the, the consolidated food system in this country, the, the, the industrial scale food system is all about cheap food. It's all about highly pro ultra processed, uh, as inexpensively uh, developed as possible, packaged to the hilt, promoted with lots of marketing dollars to be sold uh, cheaply, um, with, that, with very little nutritional value in many cases. And so I don't think we should be trying to compete against that. What we, what we have an opportunity for is competing as an alternative to that. 
And I think that's what most Vermonters who are who are actively engaged in in local food purchasing understand. They understand the values. Uh, they're 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 putting their dollars where their values are, which is around local high quality products made by our neighbors who are able to. Uh, it stays fresher longer. It tastes better. There's just so many benefits to to buying uh, more local products. The challenges presented by a consolidated, globalized agroeconomy are great, and in great challenges are great opportunities. For over a hundred years, the pendulum has swung towards consolidated power for a shrinking number of players in the food system. Access to high-level policy decision-making has also been consolidated, but Shane Rogers sees a path forward. Really what it's going to take is the will of those in decision-making positions to not only put the investment in, but to take a really good hard look at whether those who are making decisions are the ones that should be making decisions, right? We do need to do and we do need a redistribution of power in our communities as well so that those who are most impacted are the ones that are making sure that their voices are heard. So again, there's no snap of the finger to make this all happen. But what there is, is a bunch of individual people and organizations that can be working together to taking small steps, which eventually are going to amass into this new system, this new localized system that we're going to see and we want to see. A localized food system built at the community level that balances the strengths and needs of the community creates more economic autonomy empowered civic participation, and community well-being. On the next episode of Root Words, we'll explore a local alternative to global consolidation, the community food web. This episode was produced by Stephen Abatel and Julia Anderson. Special thanks to Steve Gorlick, Shane Rogers, and Ellen Kaler. To learn more, check out Steve Gorlick's films and books at Local Futures www.localfutures.org Our musical themes are by the Salt Ash Serenaders. We are a project of the Vermont Farmers Food Center and SAGE. Thank you all for listening and for being a part of our local food system. We'll catch you next time on Root Words.